tired. Rawr. Rawr. I had a tired and busy, sort of a busy week, man. I did a wedding yesterday outside at a gazebo in Kent, like in 25 degree weather. <laughs> it was a quick wedding, because they were like, go as fast as you can and don't be blabbing, bro, you know? Uh, but I got to marry these two folks. Keep them in prayer, man. I like, they're searching, you know? So like, I got to connect with them, so. It was a good opportunity, and then otherwise, yeah, just a big, busy week along with all that stuff. A little bit of door dashing, full-time ministry stuff, you know, like all sorts of stuff happening, um, contacting folks about leadership stuff, and like stuff moving with our church, and prepping worship, and prepping sermons, and connecting with folks, and meeting with folks, and all that sort of stuff, and we're working even on some hip-hop tracks that we're going to feature next week, man, we're going to start... We're going to have some hip-hop worship involved in what we're doing every week, so excited about that. Lots of good stuff going on, man. You even heard some of those weird beats I made this week, because I really wanted to do stuff about the rock of our salvation, and I just decided to make some weird beats on the fly, so that's what that was. But I mean, like, it was fun, man. It was good. Lots going on this week, lots of meaningful things as well. I want to talk a little bit today about enoclophobia, okay? Enoclophobia. <laughs> you ever heard of that before? Enoclophobia is an irrational fear of crowds. Did you know that? It's a person with this phobia. They experience high levels of anxiety when they're in a crowd or they're just thinking about being in a crowd. They experience that, yeah? You know, I hope none of you today are feeling that way, you know? <laughs> Many people with enoclophobia do their best to avoid crowds in any situation. So they avoid movies, they avoid parties, they avoid festivals, they avoid theme parks, right? Naturally, right? They avoid concerts or any other place that might draw a lot of people. And I mean... It must be a tough fear to have, right? And I'm glad there's online church services, and I'm glad we record stuff and put it out again. Because, I mean, like, Christ followers could struggle with enoclophobia. Like, that's a real thing, yeah? But, I mean, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm getting to a metaphor, as you could guess, all right? Because we as Christ followers, we need a certain degree of spiritual enoclophobia as Christ followers. We need a little bit of fear of the crowds. And what I mean is we got to have a healthy fear of like how the ways of the crowd or the ways of culture or the ways of the world can like creep into our faith as Christ followers. Y'all with me? And I mean, we need some spiritual enoclophobia, just like wanting to stand out for Christ and not in a way that's obnoxious, not in a way that's hurtful, not in a way that's negative, not in a way that's judgy, not in a way that's self-righteous, not in a way that's blatantly sinful. But we want spiritual enoclophobia. I mean, Jesus himself said this. He said, the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it, but narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. That's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, and he says, hey, the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. There's many who do that. There's many who go the way of destruction, but narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. And again, the narrow gate ain't a self-righteous gate. It ain't like a religious gate. Like... It's not like a sinful gate, but like it's a gospel gate. Yeah? It's the gateway through Christ is this gate of grace where we're forgiven people. And we need a little bit of spiritual anarchophobia. I mean, how can we be sure that what the narrow gate is? How do we know that we're bearing fruit for Jesus? How can we really be sure that our life is built on Christ the solid rock as we sang about today? I mean, we've been in this series it's called God in the Margins, and we've been going through the book of Luke. We're going to go through the book of Acts as well. We're going to take our time in it because there's a lot in there. Same author. And one of the ways that God hung in the margins when he came to earth through really this, his son, Jesus Christ, they're separate people, but Jesus was fully God and fully human, right? Jesus came and he was marginalized in a way where he lived in a way and called people to a way of life as well that stood out, that was different, that was spiritually anaclophobic. Is that a word? Yeah? And again, Jesus taught us in Luke 6, 43 through 49, and that's where we're going to be, and I'll throw it up here, that a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, but on the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Yeah? Somebody say, that's heavy. Amen. How can one know the character of a person? Well, Jesus says, check the fruit. What kind of results come out of their life? And we're talking about the character qualities, the fruit of Christ, 
the ways of Jesus coming out of a human being, like oozing out of a person, like on display for people to see. How do you know the character of a person? Jesus says, look at the fruit. Like, look at like, the things that happen in our life. Look at the kind of relationships they have. Look at the kind of results they have with the way they treat people and the way they act and the way they live and the integrity they have. Like, if they have the fruit of me living in them, right? Because Jesus said, I'm the vine and the branches, and if you're in me, you're going to bear fruit, right? right? If they have Christ fruit coming out of their life, it's going to be good fruit. If they don't, it ain't going to be good fruit. All right? One wasn't going to get figs from thorn bushes. One wasn't going to get grapes from bramble bushes. You don't pick bananas off of pricker bushes, right? Somebody needs to hear this today. Stop expecting that toxic person in your life to all of a sudden be good for you. Stop expecting that person that bears nothing but bad fruit. And just because they got a little nugget that tastes like a little apricot, but it's a little bit rotten, once in a while, that you stick in that relationship in a way where it hurts you, okay? Have boundaries. I mean, somebody needs to hear that today. Don't expect people that are in a bad place to bear good fruit. They need the Holy Spirit. They need Christ to fill them. They need that to bear that fruit. Don't expect that. Don't be doctoring that. Don't be expecting to make that happen for somebody else, okay? And let me ask you today, is your life bearing good fruit or bad fruit, okay? Because Jesus wasn't saying that salvation in him wasn't a free gift. It is. It's free, Jesus died for us because he loves us. Jesus gave his life for messed up, jacked up people that don't have it together, that need forgiveness and need salvation and need resurrection and need hope. And he takes us right where we are and we could be totally, totally gone and we could be a dead tree and he'll raise us to life. But, I mean, people who have Christ in them do bear the fruit of Christ, yeah? Jesus was saying that those who have truly been rescued by him will bear fruit for him living in them. That's a fact. What does that look like? You know what I think we need to do? We need to have a fruit check. Yes. Can we have a fruit check today? Yeah. Will you help me check the fruit for us? Can I check my own fruit and check your fruit today? Is that all right? Can I do that with you? Can I check it? Fruit check step number one is the fruit of the Spirit coming out of your life, okay? I mean, we're talking about the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Of the Spirit. Is that coming out of your life? Do people observe that? Like, I want you to ask God genuinely right now if any of these things are true of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is that in you? Is that an observable thing in you? Do people say that about you? And then when they say it about you, do you go, yeah, man. I got it together. I got it together. Because, I mean, if you're not a narcissist or sociopath, I mean, reflect on what, whether others say that they say these things coming out of you. And would people say that these things come out of you? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does that characterize people's experience of you? Yeah? And if that's true, do you give credit to Christ? Or do you go, yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, I'm working on it, you know? <laughs> you're like, hey, man, you're so gentle. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I am. Or you, don't, or you, you go, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm so not. Or you go, well, you know, like, I, I really am. Because the in-between is like, well, Jesus is gentle, and his gentleness is in me. <laughs> and he's the reason why. His joy is in me. His love is in me. His peace is in me. His patience is in me. His kindness is in me. He taught me that stuff. I didn't know it until he taught me. Yeah? Okay, fruit check number two. You ready? You with me on the fruit check? Take a moment and ask God if bad fruit is in your life. Okay? Is bad fruit coming out of your life? Like, Because Jesus says it, so we got to look at it. Paul says that before he writes about the fruit of the Spirit, that the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality... Moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. That's Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the one that people don't read before Galatians 5, 23. They don't want to hear that part. They want to hear the later part. And the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit would be lovelessness, joylessness, peacelessness, impatience, unkindness, wickedness unfaithfulness, harshness, and no self-control, yeah? Ask God to do a bad fruit check in you. Is, is there bad fruit? I mean, like, are any of these things in your life? Like, 
we're always struggling with this stuff. It's not like I, I, I named that list. I had an outburst of anger yesterday with my middle kid. And then I realized this came from my childhood somehow. Again, another thing I uncovered. <laughs> like, because she was born in my littlest, and I got real defensive. And I realized, oh my gosh, I had a close family member that bullied me my whole life. When I was very little, and I got triggered. And I had an outburst. And bad fruit showed up. You got me? You got to admit it, okay? I'm not admitting this so you go, oh, he's so sinful, I got good fruit. I'm saying this so you'll admit where your bad fruit's at. You got it? Because again, if you're not a narcissist or you're not a sociopath, which I know none of you are, reflect on whether others say, I hope none of you are, (laughs) reflect on whether others say that they see these things coming out of you or not. Do they see like the opposite of the fruit of spirit coming out of you? Do they see lovelessness, joylessness, peacelessness? Impatience, unkindness, unfaithfulness, harshness, no self-control. I mean, do people say that, like, you're sexually loose? Do they say that, like, you, like, have all sorts of gods in your life? (laughs) Do they say that you cause hatred or that you cause strife between people? Would they say you're jealous? Would they say that you're angry and you have outbursts and you have a temper problem? Would they say you have selfish ambitions, like you're selfish, or you cause dissensions or factions? Would they say that you're envious of people? Would they say you're a drunk? Would they say that, like, you got a drinking problem? I mean, again, like, we want the fruit of the Spirit, right? So that's the fruit check. I mean, ask my wife and kids. My wife has seen me go through this battle against anger my whole life. And there are reasons. Guess what? All the stuff you got, all the bad fruit in your life, you got reasons. You got a story behind every bad fruit that you're struggling with. And guess what, man? Jesus wants to turn that thing inside out. We all struggle with stuff, okay? Jesus wants to meet you, and he wants you to repent of that stuff and give it to him and admit it to him, yeah? Yeah. And then he also wants you to repent of that stuff and admit it to trusted people that love him, right? And he wants people to mentor you through it and walk you through it that have the good fruit, that have gotten through that stuff, yeah? Yeah? And again, that's what we want. How else do we know what kind of tree we are and what kind of fruit we're producing? I mean, Jesus talked about what comes out of our mouths. He talked about our mouths. That's what he said. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Say it with me. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. We got to remember to remove the plank here. (laughs) It's like why I had to do it was you. Because I just know, like, man, the mouth is so hard to control. It just is. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison, the book of James says. We use it to destroy and to hurt folks, man. That's our nature, and it's what we do, and it's, like, just in us to do that, man. And, I mean, what comes out of our mouth can be loving or loveless. It can be joyful or joyless. It can be peaceful or peaceless. It can be patient or impatient. I mean, it could be kind or unkind. It could be good or wicked. It could be faithful or unfaithful, gentle or harsh, and self-controlled or hazardous and tactless. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Now, the NIV Woman's Study Bible, all right, for you ladies and for us men in here, (laughs) notes that in Jesus' day, do I got any ladies out there? The NIV Woman's Study Bible notes that in Jesus' day, the heart stood for the whole person in both Hebrew and Greek thought, Yeah. The heart was the center of the body's essential functions, physical, intellectual, emotional, moral, and spiritual. The heart was seen as the dwelling place of the spirit. Yeah? Jesus' point here was that a person's actions flowed out of inner attitudes and choices, whether these were good or evil. Yeah? That's what that study Bible says. So what we say says a lot about who we are. What comes out of our mouth dictates who we are out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks what's coming out of our mouth what we're talking about what we're saying has a lot to do with what's just inside of us that's what jesus is teaching you all know the movie uh, inside out i got a two-year-old so i just reference kids movies all the time because i just live in this world i got a two eight and eleven year old daughter okay and i'm back in this world again i'm 42 with a two-year-old so we're living in like this is i like kids movies though okay And inside out, I admit it fully. In inside out, basically what happens in this story, it's a great one. Have you seen it before? Basically, this girl, Riley, she's a teenage kid. She's on the verge. She's like preteen, about to become a teenager. 
And she has joy, fear, sadness, disgust, and anger, all like personified, living in her brain, like running her body and running her mind, right? And they are living in her, and they're like dictating certain things. And when she has an outburst, one of them takes over, or two of them team up and take over. And she basically goes through puberty in the story, and then all of these aspects of her mature and start to work together. And there's this beautiful like synergy that happens where all of a sudden, like, Anger like gets redeemed and used for good things, right? Disgust gets redeemed and used for good things because it's good to be disgusted at certain things. It's good to be angry about injustice and sin, right? Like fear gets used for good things to protect her. Sadness is used to bring depth to her and compassion and mercy and joy combines with the others and isn't this isolated thing. You want to know what, man? You want to know what? You know where I'm getting at here? You with me? You with me on this? Jesus redeems the inner parts of us, and he doesn't condemn them. He takes our anger and redeems it. He doesn't just go, get rid of your anger and pretend like you love me. He says, I'm going to redeem it and use it for good. I, I'm not just going to, like, you know, throw out your disgust. I want to use it for good. I want you to be disgusted at the things I'm disgusted by. Yeah? I want you to be afraid of the things I'm afraid of, Right? And I want you to have a healthy fear of me in you. I want you to be sad about the things I'm sad about. I want, I want you to have joy in the things I'm joyful about, not the things that I don't have joy about. Yeah? Jesus wants to redeem every part of us. And I mean, Jesus wasn't trying to make us afraid of having rough patches in our lives that don't produce as much fruit. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't doing that. When we think about that, like, we have rough patches. He wasn't saying, guess what? You make bad fruit, you're not a me, you're no good, see ya. He's going, hey, you're all going to struggle with bad fruit. I got good fruit, except my fruit. I got your fruit, okay? Because guess what? You're going to have times where you struggle. You're going to have times where there's fruit coming out that you don't like. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to produce good fruit all the time. That's not possible. It's not possible for human beings. It's possible for Jesus, but not us. And I mean, Jesus knows that, and he wants to shepherd you through that. He wants to love you through that. And he wants to carry you through that and remind you, hey, guess what? I died for you. I rose again for you. I've forgiven you. And that thing you're struggling with right now, I can break the chains of it. I can stop it from having hold of your life and controlling you. I can stop it from having prominence in your life. Only Jesus can. But, you know, one can fake like they know Christ and not know him at all. One could lie to themselves about it. People can do that. There's plenty that do. You can fake like you do and not really know them. And one can even be deceived into thinking they know Christ and have no clue about him. I mean, that's the danger. And let's talk about it in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. It's impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. That's a strong word from the word. And we got to be reminded, yeah, I mean, like, we don't want to be fake with God. That's it. Be real with him, because he wants to do a work in your life. And he wants to take you where you're at and help you. Because if Christ has bought you with his blood, if he really has risen again, and he has, if he sits at the right hand of God, and he does, if he sent the Holy Spirit to live in you, and the Holy Spirit's alive, all right, if he wants to do a miracle in you, if he wants to heal you, if he wants to love on you, if he wants to redeem you, if he wants to pull you out of the pit, you can bet that he'll deliver you through all the ups and downs of your life. If you're in a valley now, he's with you, yeah. in it. He's with you. Okay? He is for you, not against you. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. If you're struggling right now, recommit your life to him. Give everything over to him, all of it. Just give it all. You had a relationship with him at one point, and you walked. Give it back. He's a God of second, third, hundreds, five thousand chances. It ain't never too late to just give your life over and then keep giving it. Keep giving it. Keep giving it. You know, I love Rich Mullins, man. He talked about this. He's like, yeah, this lady asked me, like, hey, have you been born again, Rich? Because she was trying to test me to see if I was for real, a real Christian, Christian musician. He's like, well, yeah, lady, like, about every second, man. He's like, because, man, when I was a kid, I, like, gave my life to Jesus at some camp, and I didn't really mean it. And then years later, I gave my life to him again, you know? And then, like, 
I gave my life to him about every year, and then I sort of gave it to him like every month, and then I sort of gave it to him like every week, and then I gave it to him like every day, and then now it's like, it became like every hour, and then it became like every minute, and then it became like every second. Like, yeah, I, I, I need to be born again like all the time. Yeah? You can be with him again. He has not given up on you. Amen. We can only give up on him. Yep. And man, maybe you just need to let him have your way in your life for the first time because he'll do that. Yep. You can bet. Take it from me. An ex-addict. All right? Didn't grow up in the church. Criminal. You know, addicted. Messed up. You know, making mistakes. Getting arrested a couple times. Almost not making it out of high school. Dropping out of college. Like working dead-end jobs. Like in toxic relationships and toxic patterns and toxic addictions and all that. And Jesus took me right where I was at and said, Ben, come on. You're mine. I love you. You may think you're all jacked up. You may think you don't got a shot. But I love you. And I died for you. And I rose again for you. And my promise is on you. And you can walk with me from here on forward. I'll take you right where you're at. And I love you. And I will forgive you. Woo. All right. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house. We sung about it all morning, y'all. We'll sing about it one more time, too. Who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock, and when the flood came, the river crashed against that house and could shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the destruction of that house was great, all right? Now, my kids, okay, they know I have problems. They know that I'm not a perfect dad. They know that I have sins and struggles. I'm open about that stuff with them, and y'all should be too. Don't hide that stuff from your kids. But they know all that about me, but they also know... That, hey, there's times where dad's going to take me on a daddy-daughter date. He's going to take me to the mall. He's going to go buy me a smoothie. He's going to take me to a playground. He's going to take me on a road trip. He is going to love me and care for me. He, like, works hard. Even DoorDash is a little on the side to make sure I got clothes on my back, even though plenty of them are hand-me-downs because we're in ministry, all right? He makes sure we got a roof over our head. He makes sure that we're all good. Like, he ain't so good at helping mom with laundry. He needs to get better at that. But he's working at it. And they know that I love them in that way. And if my kids respect, love, and value my opinions for what I do for them, which I really don't always, but if they do, if they could love me, who's messed up, why wouldn't we value Jesus' words <laughs> more than anything? The one who's perfect, who's the sinless son of God who died for us, who gave his life for us, and was perfectly sin- Why wouldn't we value the words of Christ? Why could we, how could we be flippant about the words of Christ? He's done all he's done for us, huh? How could we? Because any disciple who respects Jesus should do what he says. How can one call him Lord and not do what he says? That's hypocrisy, all right? That's an NIV application commentary that says that. And Swami Vivekananda was quoted to say, it is better to be an outspoken atheist than a hypocrite. It's better to just like not believe than to not live it. It's true. It's a truth. Man, I do this analogy way too much, but you all know Melly Vanelli? I, used, I, I think I've used him in like five analogies. <sighs> Melly Vanelli was this happening pop group. They were good looking dudes that could really dance and could really perform and had major charisma, right? And they got up, and in the late 80s and early 90s, they danced and they sang, right? And they performed, and they did concerts, and they were a big hit. They got Grammys. You know, they got awards for being number one. They were well-loved, well-known, and well-respected. And then one day, they were performing on MTV, or they are performing at some show somewhere, and MTV caught it. And all of a sudden, because it was the day back before computers were around to do this, and it was a CD or something, and it just starts skipping. Girl, you know it. 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 Like, it just, they skipped. And then they, like, got derailed, and they got exposed for lip syncing. And it was found out that they couldn't sing. And they had been faking it for years, right? Oh all know. Come on. Somebody say Melly Vanelli. Now, 
It's better to be an outspoken atheist than a hypocrite. Like, it'd be better. It's sad. One of these cats, his life ended in tragedy and addiction. It's sad. Because, I mean, like, it'd be better if they had never had anything to do with music than to be involved and then have that happen. You know what I mean? So it'd be better to not believe than to believe and not live it. You know? And, I mean, Melly Vanelli is always an example of this stuff. I, I'll probably do an analogy about them in a month. Again. <laughs> Because we need to build our house on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. All right? We need to build it on him. He's the firm foundation. In Mexico Beach, Florida, the carnage left in the wake of 2018 Hurricane Michael was staggering. But among the devastating scenes aired across cable news channels and published by national media outlets, something stood out amongst the rubble. A single house named the Sand Palace. You know about it? It appeared to have escaped the storm virtually unscathed. As reported by CNN, this was no coincidence. The Sand Palace was designed by architects to do just that. At every point, from pilings to the roof and everything in between, when it came time to make a decision about what level of material or what to use, we didn't pay attention to code, said LeBron Lackey. Sharing the story of the project with CNN, he said this, we went above and beyond code, and we asked the question, what would survive the big one? Yeah? Are we consistently trying to build for that? Do we go above and beyond to build our life on a firm foundation to resist the big floods and the big hurricanes and the big storms? When the construction of the residence was completed earlier during the year of 2018 that Hurricane Michael hit, Lackey couldn't have imagined that its stormproof features would be put to the test so quickly and so severely. But when the owner scanned images of the damaged beachfront, he realized that the house had passed the test. Yeah? Which architectural features or construction process played a part in this home standing strong while so many surrounding it collapsed? Seven key design decisions contributed. And I'm reading here from uh, Arkitzer.com. It's a blog. Walls were made of poured, reinforced concrete. Jeff appreciates this. The building sat atop pilings that are 40 foot deep. He does construction. Steel cables traveled from the girders above the pilings to the roof. I don't know any of this stuff. And continued down the back wall. I don't know how to build nothing, okay? Except like a guitar cord, all right? A proposed balcony on the east wall was removed at the design stage. The roof overhang was kept very small compared with adjacent properties. Some proposed windows were replaced with concrete. The house was raised on stilts so that the storm surge could pass underneath. And these features were all about surpassing the norm. Yeah? As CNN highlights, state code in the wake of Hurricane Andrew in 1992 required that houses have to be built to withstand 120 mile per hour winds. Lackey's Sand Palace was built to withstand 240 to 250 mile per hour wind. Of course, these resilient features did not come for free. Lackey's architect, Charles A. Gaskin, we love Charles, Gaskin, said that building a house the way they did roughly doubled the cost per square foot compared with ordinary building practices. The cost was high, yeah? Given the raw intensity of Hurricane Michael, the Sand Palace must be viewed as a success story for the architects and engineers behind it. The project will become a case study in resilient design along the Florida coast, yeah? <laughs> when the next storm hits, hopefully there will be many more Sand Palaces left standing. When Jesus returns, hopefully there are going to be a lot of Christ Palaces built. I said, when Jesus returns, yes. hopefully there are going to be some Christ palaces built. Because yes. it's not how we build. It's the fact that he builds us. Yes. And he's the one. He's the foundation. He's the construction person. He's the one that puts all the materials in place. He builds us. And he puts us on firm footing in him so that the storms of life ain't going to rip into us. You are the house he wants to build on him. Are you building your life on the rock of Jesus with the reinforced concrete walls of the word of God, with the 40-foot deep pilings of prayer, the long steel cables of the Holy Spirit? Are you building your life on him today? Are you removing the proposed balconies of bad earthly-minded decisions and exchanging them for heavenly-minded ones? Come on, you building your life on him. Are you? You got the stilts of faith holding you up so that the storm surges of the devil and his demons can't take you out? You build on him? You want to withstand the floods of sickness, the floods of sadness, the floods of death, the floods of discouragement, the floods of financial difficulties, the floods of relational difficulties, the floods of tragedy, the floods of life problems. Build your life on him. 
Build it on him. Man, I love the woman who anointed Jesus with crazy expensive perfume. That's what she did. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. She just gave everything she had for him. I'm going to pour it all. She adored Jesus. Many think this was Mary, the sister of Lazarus. You could bet that she loved Jesus for raising her brother from the dead, and she knew the kind of power he had. And she's like, I know that this perfume is worth everything, but I'm dumping it all on him. I want to give all to him. I want him to have every bit, because I love him. I love him. I want my life built on him. I want a firm foundation. I want him to be my Lord and my King and my love and my first love. I want that. I want Jesus more than anything in this world. She didn't go with the crowd. She stuck out. She had spiritual enochlophobia. She did. She stuck out. She, was, she didn't care what these people thought about. Even the disciples. Of course, they're dogging on a woman and these men. And this woman is worshiping Jesus more. Yeah? And they're like, why are you doing that? And she is pouring out her life. She didn't go with the crowd. She didn't build on the sand. She knew that Jesus was worthy of it all. She wanted her whole life to be given to him. And this was a, a fruit of that. It was proof of that. And I mean, she didn't neglect the structure of her house. I mean, she knew that her house, her life had to be built on him. She wasn't going to fake her way through. She wanted to worship Jesus and wanted him to have his way and wanted him to have everything in her. Christ can be trusted. He is the solid rock on which we stand. He is our firm foundation. He's the one we can trust. He's the one we can live for. He's the one we can love. He's the one we can put at the center. He's the one we can lay our lives down and just recklessly, wildly spill all our perfume over in a mess. Let's go ahead and do that. Will you spill your perfume on Jesus today? Come on, man. Spill your Dracar Noir. Spill your polo. Spill it! All of it! Just give it to him. He deserves it all. He's worthy of it all. Pour it out. Every bit. Pour out your old spice. Come on. Give it to him. Jesus, we give it all to you. We want to know you more. I, I know how much I fall short. I know how much we all fall short. I know we all have bad fruit. We trust that you're going to prune the bad fruit from our lives. And you are going to nurture those branches so they can bear good fruit. And you're going to recreate things in our lives. And you're going to redeem things in our lives that were once used for bad. And you'll use them for good. We trust you. We want our lives built on you. We want everything given to you. We want to adore you. We want to worship you. We want to love you. We give it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.